Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeff Finn, CEO at Realnex, and delighted to have you with us today. Thrilled to have Bo Barron, CCIM, joining us as our special guest for this Realnex user forum. This is our second in the, the series, and uh, we will continue to have monthly uh, user group forums online uh, using this type of session. We also have our Facebook community that we've uh, set up to be interactive throughout the day and month uh, as we, we all might have questions or ideas to post and share and wanna uh, gain best practices from other uh, Realnext users and see how they're taking advantage of the, the system or how the, the Realnext team might be able to provide some guidance along the way. So be, be sure to go to our Facebook page and sign up for that if you haven't. We also have uh, our monthly Cray Cray session where Tim Cray joins us to share uh, the latest and greatest tools uh, that have been added to the Realnext platform each month. That'll be next Thursday, four o'clock Eastern time. So if you if you have the time and interest, please join us there. Of course, we do send out the uh, replay of that and uh, as we will with this. So you'll be able to share this or, or review it and refresh. There's a lot of great uh, ideas and, and perspective that Bo is gonna share with us today. and then. Uh, Tim will join us a little bit later for a, a special uh, uh, segment where we'll have Q&A and, and some some tips and tricks of the trade that uh, might be beneficial and you'll, you'll like love to learn about. So we uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. We, we know it's a difficult time uh, given what's going on in the world and in the, the industry. We wish you all well through the, the process and hopefully uh, you, you are uh, doing the doing well and uh, and will recover quickly uh, in, as the market does uh, and to be able to take full advantage. But now is the time to uh, hone your database. We, we found in other market cycles that we've gone through the window of time where markets go through transition. It really is a, it's a great time to refresh, refocus, revamp your, your technology, your use of technology tools, your building of your database, your refinement of systems. Sometimes we get running so hard making deals uh, when the market's uh, roaring that when uh, you know you never have time to do that now is the time to, to refresh recharge and reload so uh, Bo's been doing just that uh, I, I know with his implementation of real next and uh, look forward to hearing what he's got to say and look forward to your questions and, and interaction as we go through the session please use the the question box on your right we will uh, pose them uh, at the at, at at the end of Bo's session, as well as then tee up Tim and uh, have another round of Q&A and interaction. So anything you, you wanna hear about, learn about, we'll, we'll do our best to, to be interactive and uh, keep this fast space. We're thrilled, Bo, to have you on the call. Bo's a noted uh, leading industry coach, trainer, and real estate professional. So not just teaching the industry what to do, but actually doing it himself as a CCIM and professional. Uh, you know, working working his market and now taking a very focused uh, market and building a, uh, a business around the in the self storage industry. So, Bo, look forward to um, your thoughts and perspective, how you're using Realnext and how the audience can perhaps uh, pick up some some tips from how you're taking advantage. So, let me turn over to you. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, I got to tell you, uh, a little over a year ago, my dad asked me to come back to the family business, which is commercial real estate brokerage and self-storage development and kind of start to take over things. And so I did that. Um, I left the Mossimo group uh, where I'd been for three years and I loved, I still love those folks. And, um, and so I've gotten back into commercial real estate brokerage. And so one of the first things we Try to do is figure out okay what are the what's the tool set we needed because I'm I'm taking over from from my 70 year old um, father who you know likes to use a a Manila pad as his CRM and uh, so we had to kind of skin that cat and so we took a, another look at Real Next I'd been a user years ago and and we decided to to come back and use this as our CRM and our database and I'm thrilled that we did but one thing I haven't done in a long time is is a webinar in any capacity with any kind of audience. We used to do that all the time with the Mossimo group. And so I gotta be honest with you guys, like I'm a little bit nervous. And what really helped is Chanel is on the call. And I know Chanel um, 
and so just having a friendly out in the audience is, is a big deal. So I'm glad you're with us today, Chanel. Uh, might know some of the others uh, of you on this call as well. But what I wanted to do today really is, um, oh, wait, before I start, I got a question uh, for you guys. What uh, is everybody at home? Is everybody basically working from home? Uh, I want to share my webcam just real quick because, um, look, literally, I am. Um, I came to my office for this, but I'm in a ball cap. You know, I'm literally working from home. My home office, my wife works on the other side of the office and she didn't want to be in the in the webinar. So I came back to the office just for this. But um, anyway, hopefully you guys are in um, in your office as well or at home as well, maybe in a ball cap like me. Um, all right. Enough of that stuff. Let's take a look. At, at Real Next, I really just want to take you all through what I'm doing. Um, I, I wonder a little bit if if this isn't what everybody does and how everybody uses this. I'm really interested in your feedback. Feel free to lob questions in. Uh, Jeff's going to be uh, kind of taking a look at those and he'll interject uh, if it makes sense. He might ask me to expand upon what I'm talking about a little bit. But um, the first thing I wanted to just mention, and I might go into coaching just a little bit. Hopefully, it'll be valuable to you. But if you're if you're practicing commercial real estate brokerage and you're relying on your presence and the people you know in your network for business to come and find you, then you likely might have uh, a really good business. Uh, the more well known you are, the more business just comes to you. Um, but and as we're seeing right now, especially with the coronavirus, who knows what our businesses are going to look like uh, a month from now? Uh, I've got clients who have had a lot of their wealth in the stock market and they would sell and invest in commercial real estate. I've got a deal right now about a two and a half million dollar apartment deal that might not go through now because the equity that was going to be used to purchase those apartments was in the stock market. And so that deal just got a whole lot more expensive for this buyer. Um, there is a real possibility that this nice run that we've been on is going to be over at least for a while. And the business that used to just walk in your door might go away. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to be a commercial real estate firm that relies only on its presence. Those deals are great. I want to be the kind of commercial real estate firm that goes after and pursues the business that we want. And so one of the things that I did when I came back with my dad's company and started to kind of take over the reins is we built a database of the properties that we want to go after. Uh, we've been self-storage developers since I was about three. Um, I think my dad built his first one when I was literally three years old. I'm 43 now. So we've been in the business for about 40 years. I've grown up in it. We operate it. Uh, we do some development. Um, I love self-storage. It's a part of our family DNA. And so that's the specialty I've gone with. Um, now, for me in Owensboro, Kentucky, which is where I live, population 100,000, for me to be a self-storage specialist, I'm going to have to broaden my geography. There, there might not be a self-storage transaction happen in Owensboro, Kentucky once out of every five years. So I'm going to have to go broad if I'm going to specialize in that. And so what we did is we hired a former CoStar researcher to find us every uh, self-storage property in Kentucky, where I live, in Indiana, which is our neighbor to the north, and in Tennessee, our neighbor to the south. And so if I go over here to properties, we've got them all in here. And I'll show you how to segment them a little bit uh, in the first place. But um, what we had her do uh, was find all those properties. She sent those to us in a spreadsheet, one for Kentucky, one for Tennessee, one for Indiana. And I literally uploaded those in. I imported that information and it was a really, really simple process. Um, so let me just give you a feel for um, what it looks like once you get that kind of information in here. If I go to groups and you can see I've kind of got them labeled so that they're easy to go to. If I want to see my Kentucky self storage properties, I click that group and here they all are. We got about 436 of them. My guess is that's probably about 70% uh, of what we have in the state. Uh, but if I just scroll down here and choose um, this 24-7 self-storage in Farmington Avenue in Louisville, I've gone on Google um, Google Maps and, and grabbed a picture of that property. But some of the things I know, um, 
and this doesn't seem to be a very good example. Um, didn't have a lot of the information in here. However, if I go to um, links, I can see, okay, here's the owner. The investor here is Edward Vance Evans. I've got all their contact information in here, that property. Now, let me give you a little bit of a different example here. If I go back over here, let's say I want to start calling the owners of self-storage properties in Evansville, Indiana. Then I'm going to go to my Indiana group. The only reason I say Evansville, Indiana, it's about 45 minutes from here. It's the closest, next largest town. In Indiana, I've got about 380 properties identified. And if I want to click filter here, I can show filters and we can continue to weed this down by city. Just say contains Evansville and hit search. Now I've got 26 properties in Evansville uh, and you can see I'm, I'm still going through and grabbing pictures uh, of these properties. But this this could be my call list. Now, if I want to hide the filters just to get it out of the way and I want to give me a list. So here's my call list. Let's say I'm going to start calling these folks tomorrow. Here's my call list. Um, I can check them all, go to, I believe it's linked and hit owners. And what this is going to do now is it's going to take me from all the properties in Evansville. And now it's going to create for me all the owners of the properties in Evansville. And so I'm not going to call the properties. I'm going to call the owners. So I just created for myself the call list for tomorrow. And as I roll through, I can call Alan. We can talk about his property. If I want to get back, I can either go back to the properties um, tab or I could go over here to links and see, oh, well, you know what? This guy actually owns. Well, I've got a dupe that I have to clear out. Um, but if he owned more than one property, they'd all show up here, um, which is really nice. So I can quickly look at history and I can say, well, okay, I've never called this guy before. That's good to know. Um, leads, projects. If I uh, were to talk to this guy, get him on the phone, and he's interested, I would go ahead and create a project. Uh, or we create a project for every opportunity that we're working on. Uh, so that's kind of how we use databases a little bit or the property portion of this database. Um, I want to just show you a couple other things, though. I have these segmented out. All the self-storage properties are here. I'm going to have to clear this to bring them all up. So here's all our self-storage properties. And I'm going to switch back to the tile view. I like to see a picture of the property when I'm looking at these instead of just a list. Uh, here's all our self-storage properties. We also uh, look at apartment properties. Uh, within our immediate market of Owensboro. That's kind of what I specialize in and what I call on. And so, look, if you're in, if you're on this call and you've got a brokerage practice and you don't have the property information and you don't know who owns them and who to call and you're not pursuing the types of deals that you actually want to do, then your problem is this. You only get to work on the deals that come your way and when things dry out, when there's a global pandemic and everything seizes up, your business goes away. If we have a downturn like in 2008 where the bubble pops and everybody feels it for a couple of years, the people that left the business were the people who just did the deals that came to them. They relied on their network and their presence in the market to get their deals. Those who were able to get through that downturn and actually pick up market share were those who were prospecting. They were pursuing the properties and the types of deals that they wanted because they had a database in place. And so if you're on this call and you're thinking, man, what's the next thing that I can do to take my brokerage to the next level is create a property database of the types of deals that you want to do. You can either do it yourself. You can delegate it to somebody else. Or you can literally hire a third party to and pay them like I did to get all of this information for you. And then you simply put it in an Excel spreadsheet, turn it into a CSV file, upload it, 
and a couple minutes later it's all here and it's a beautiful thing jeff is there anything else you want me to expand on uh before One i kind of move from that here that came in is uh do you have a frame of reference on what that research cost to to get the database built to begin with so well i can tell you what we did um we hired this researcher, former co-star researcher. She's a stay-at-home mom. She's fantastic. I've never met her. It's been all virtual. We paid about $20 an hour, and she averaged 10 to 12 properties an hour. So I paid around, what, a dollar? Two bucks a property, something under two bucks a Yeah, property. a little under two bucks a property for all this. Money well spent. Money very well spent. It would cost me much more if I spent my own time trying to create this. Now, if you're new to the business, I would suggest to you to, to um, try to get a lot of this information yourself because you need to learn your market. And this is a great way to do it. But if you're already an expert in your market or you've been in the business for a while, this is a, the perfect kind of thing to pay money to get this kind of information so you can focus on your high dollar activities, which is actually calling people. But what I did to get those pictures uh jeff is i went to google maps went to the street view used uh, Snagit, which is an application that allows you to take screenshots save the image this is what i do at night for fun uh sitting in bed with my laptop because uh i'm really cool like that uh, but i just like to have a picture of the property i like to know okay that's that property i remember so then a couple of questions on as you're, you're going through your your business development uh, you've got that list of properties you start calling the the owners when do you, when is it a lead when is it an opportunity how do you sort of transition them through the funnel what are your, your thoughts on that that's a great question this is where uh real next has a lot more capability than i've actually uh, learned and implemented um, for me, once I get a live one, somebody on the phone where there's a next step, I'm going to turn that into a project where the property becomes a project. So you can see if I go to projects here that here's the, the opportunities that we're working on. OK, um, just different deals. And again, I'm trying to throw pictures up there. But once I get a live one, I put them on here. And if I go to let's just say the Athenian, we just put this under contract. If I go to history, you know, here's a lot of the history. We've got three pages of this stuff. Um, you know, here's the different people we talked about it, notes on that stuff. We're recording all that. Uh, I don't know if there's any events scheduled. Yeah, we've got three events um, moving forward to, to follow up on this stuff. So if we get a live one, I turn it into a project. Now, there are... There is a leads functionality here that I've seen Tim demonstrate that's really cool. I just haven't gotten my my head around it yet. Well, uh, one of the cool things while you're, you're there, just if you go back into projects real quick mm -hmm. and um, you uh, yeah. just pick one of them and you can go into the project and you can actually set your your status and result so and, and reason so you sort of can manage through this Athenian YMCA and you can set up your own table. So you see there's a status table and that can be whatever you, you like to use as status for a for sale property. And you mm -hmm. sort of take them through beginning to end. Then you have a result and a reason. So you can really track all of your activity and, and your deal pipeline from that initial prospecting through your pitch through your listing through your sale process and cycle and all of that is under your system settings you can you can set that up to to be sure that whatever language you like and whatever stages that you like to set you, you have that built for you mm -hmm. and uh, we, we start the system with a, a preset uh, framework but you can you can tweak it to whatever you like yeah, and that was one of the things the first things that i did was i got into that table and i started using i changed um the words that you use exactly. uh, your default descriptions work and it makes sense but we use different language here in uh, western kentucky and so i changed it to the actual words that we use just to make that easier to easier to actually implement as we're going forward hey bob um, yes 
Uh, this is Tim. When hey. you're when you're done, I'll do a quick overview of how to add leads quickly and what how to use them. Does your right. research use the app at all to go out and farm these buildings? I don't know what she used to be honest with you. Um, if you don't the first know thing I did, you, there's an app that you, that's free that works on your phone or your iPad or your whatever you use. And you can just point the app at a building and hit the picture button. It'll take a photo and it'll automatically add the building and the address to your database. Then you get back home, you can do research on it. But <clears throat> to catalog your buildings, you just get in your car, drive to an area, get out, walk from building to building, point your phone at the building and hit snapshot and go to the next one. And when you get back home, you'll have 40 buildings with photos in your in your property database. And then you just go through and, and have somebody like that update them or, or she can use the app too, it's free. Oh, wow. that's the real next app? Yep. Right, right. It's the full program on your phone. It has all of the things that you can do in this, except it's on your phone. You can see the history, yeah. you can add as many photos for each property as you want. You can look up anything, you can query anything. It's, it's, it's the full thing on your phone, but there's some integration because of things like the ability for a phone to take a photo. And we just wrote the code to automatically add it to the database so you don't have to do anything. Just take the picture, take four of them, and they all get added for you automatically. That's, that's beautiful. So I use the app. I just didn't realize you could do that with it. Yeah, it's what I use it for mostly, just to catalog buildings. That's fantastic. Um, I wanted to show one other thing. Um, let me go back here. Here's my Evansville self-storage facility um, call list, uh, if I were going to do that. Now, the way we have things set up is I like to send a letter before I call. I like to give some value up front in that letter. It's just a prospecting letter, and I send it. Um, I've got one that I send to apartment owners. Um, matter of fact, we do about four a year. And so four different letters, four different types of valuable information, whether it be local comps or whatever the case may be. Uh, same for self storage. So we'll send that out um, before I call. And so if I tell my assistant that, hey, we're going to start calling on Evansville self storage uh, owners in about two weeks, what she will do is she'll go up here to timelines and manage templates and we'll choose the apartment prospecting letter campaign even though i've got a self-storage database here we'll just use that template and where did you it get, go you get close you got it oh, start it let me oh that's right i gotta hit the, the little arrow here okay so now i'm going to tell it when to start and in this case we might start it on monday just as an example um, and then it's linked to, I'm going to use the guy's first name, Alan Tolly. Now, uh, Tim, can, I can do this for everybody on this list, correct? Right. At one time. Great. So I could go ahead and hit Barry Cox is the next guy. Um, then Brian Head, I'm not going to do all of these, but just as an example, say we do those three, click next. This is the template. And so what this does is this creates to do's for my assistant. She'll grab the letter, print it, lay it on my desk, have me sign it, and then she'll send the letters and then she'll clear out those phases. And then it automatically on the 30th of this month, the way I set it up, it's going to show up on my dashboard that, hey, it's time to call this person. Now, here's the beautiful thing about this. I've got my call list. All right. I'm going to send them a prospect letter to warm them up a little bit and increase my chance of them taking my call. Give them some value up front so that I can trigger some reciprocity and get them on the phone. <coughs> Excuse me. And then oh, all I have to do is start the timeline and my assistant is going to print out the letter. She's going to send it. All that happens without my involvement. And then I don't even have to remember when to follow up because this timeline is going to create this event where I need. It tells me, hey, follow up, give them a call. And so if I were to hit next here, um, timeline details, hit finish, close. I'm going to close this out because I don't want to send the apartment letters to my self-storage people. That would be confusing. But this is just a way to automate your workflow 
so that it frees you up to do higher dollar activities. And a lot of this happens because my assistant is doing it all. Uh, all I have to do is initially write the letter. I have to tell her when it's time to implement this timeline. And then I have to make the calls um, to the actual prospect. Everything else is handled by her. I love the fact that I can automate that workflow. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna close this dialogue. So I just wanna show you how that's possible. Um, by the way, if you go to guide me and you just type in timeline, if you haven't done this yet, creating a timeline template, it, this thing just, it tells you how to do it with the little click. So click tools, then it's gonna tell you to click timelines. It takes you through the whole process. It's kind of marine proof. And I used to be a Marine, so that was uh, important for me. They make it really, really It'll actually simple. build a few of them for you. There's an automated workflow that'll just, you can set it up as a wizard and it'll, it'll sort of just pre-populate a handful of uh, timelines for you as well, so. Yeah, so I love that kind of functionality. Um, and I've already gone longer than I'm supposed to. So let me just show you my dashboard real quick. This is the brain of, of my workflow. This is my digital brain. Every time I talk to somebody, the goal is that I get my notes from that conversation into Real Next. And uh, the best practice that I would encourage you all to use is there's always a next step. Even if you lose a deal, like set up, a next step to follow up with them in six months to make sure things worked out for them and see if there's another type of opportunity. Um, so when I get here in the morning and I've already worked through the majority of my to do's for today, but here's a couple like, for instance, Brad Osborne, I talked to him earlier. I didn't put my notes in just so I could use it as a description or as a demonstration here. I'm going to click on the little sandwich. I call this the little hamburger icon. I don't know what you guys call it, but I'm going to go here and click finish and follow up. And what that allows me to do here is, uh, you know, it's got the project I'm working on. It's got the prospect that I'm working with. It's got my notes from my last conversation. And I talked with him again today. And basically all he told me was uh, he spoke to his partner and they are considering the opportunity. All right, so I'm going to record that we had that conversation and I'm going to click follow up and I'm going to schedule my next step so that I don't have to remember it. And so I just roll through here real quickly when we're not creating proposals anymore. So I'm just going to put follow up. It's a to do. I normally put these priorities as normal. Um, it it brings with it the project I'm working on. So I don't have to put that in again. It brings with it already who I'm talking with the prospect. So I don't have to bring that over to a new dialog box. And I'll probably follow up with him next Wednesday. Uh, I like to keep these timeless unless it's an actual meeting. And I leave my notes from the last uh, the last time I connected with them so that when this pops back up on my uh, dashboard next Wednesday, it reminds me about my, la my last conversation. I'm I don't have to go dig it up. And then I just click save. And that has scheduled my next step. I click save to clear this one out. And so the Brad Osborne Pedley property next step is now in Real Next. And Real Next is going to remind me next Wednesday that I need to follow him up again. That's how my workflow goes as I'm working through this. There's always a next step. And so I'm hitting finish and follow up all the time, even if it's just clearing this out and saying that I left a message, that's what I do. And then I hit follow up and figure out when I want to try them again. And uh, it gets it out of my brain so I can free up my mental bandwidth to whoever the next thing on the list is. I'm not trying to remember all of this stuff and allowing things to fall through the cracks. So if you're not at least using, um, you know, the real next core this way i mean this is the simple simple stuff i think um there's so much more power that that real next have that i haven't even tapped into yet but this allows me to clear my mind and focus on the thing in front of me and not allow things to fall through the cracks it allows me to automate my workflow it allows me to pursue the properties that i want to do deals on so that i can control the the trajectory of my business moving forward and not 
just rely on the market to continue to go well that you know we try not to practice highway brokerage where you just stand on the highway and get run over by a deal we want to go after the types of of transactions that we want to do and this is how we do it we use real nix to do it and so uh jeff i'll try to wrap it up there i know you guys have some more um some more things you want to share with the folks but if there's any questions i'm happy to take any questions that's awesome thanks well you know all of those events and, and act and histories as you go through them they're great for your own deal management and prospecting but when you combine that event history with your lead pipeline which tim's going to show us in, in a second you have incredible client reports as well so as you're doing your work once you win the, the project you've got a very efficient way to manage your workflow using the timeline and so that that becomes part of your pitch you show the client here's what i'm going to do if you hire me then you do it and you've got your your reporting automated and, and built in with beautiful client ready reports that come out so that's uh that's great stuff thanks bo you bet uh, let's see who do i need to make the presenter i can do that because there's two of me on there to confuse you <laughs> Tim came in looking like me, but we'll make him the presenter. Tim, it's going to be all yours. And a, a, a couple of things, but I went, as I turn it over to Tim, if you could, Tim, one of the questions that came in as, as I was talking about it, since you've got control, uh, if you can show how you manage those status fields that, that Bo was working on as you are working through projects. And then uh, Chanel came to us with a series of questions after the last user group with how do we manage organizational hierarchies and Tim's going to talk to us about that so I think Tim you'll take us through some uh, lead management um, if you could also show that that uh, status management and the corporate hierarchy and if there are other questions that come in for Bo or Tim as we go please uh, send them our way and we will try to address as many as we can hi everyone uh, I'll just do a little bit. I know that your time is valuable. Uh, at the top of the real next screens, all of the screens, there's an orange bar. It says the logo and there's a couple of menus. One of the menus is settings. Under settings, you have system tables. That's where you set up all of your projects, event types and all of that. It's all under that one menu. So settings and system tables. You can set up your event types. What's that? Event types, if you use Outlook, you have a uh, phone call. I don't even, I don't even know, I'm not even sure Outlook gives you any event types, but some programs will give you event type, a phone call, a meeting, or a to-do. So you can flag your event as one of those three, but that's all. Well, that wasn't enough for me. I had tours, I had all kinds of things I wanted to know what they were. So when you go into event types, you get to define as many event types as you want. And that way you can quickly go into your calendar and say, show me tours, show me closings, show whatever it is, it'd be anything you want. When you create an event type, you can also give it a color. So if something's really important to you, you might make it a color and then on your calendar, it sticks out because of the color. Don't go crazy because if you just, if everything has a color, it's like a Christmas tree, you can't, you can't find anything at all. Just try to keep it to things that are important. But it is a really good idea to separate out your event types. In my company, I wanted people making cold calls and there's a difference between a cold call and a call. So they had to create events that were cold calls so I could see that they were actually making cold calls every day and finishing them in the history. You might think that's overkill, but the problem with these guys was it, they weren't making enough calls and they weren't making money. Now the guys who were making money were fine. They were making calls like crazy, but the, the other guys just were sitting there waiting for the phone to ring, I guess. So you can create these event types. They're very helpful, even if you're just by yourself. And then also you have um, projects set up. Projects is what uh, Bo was showing. You can, we, it comes with these project types, for sale, for lease, buyer rep, tenant rep, but you can create as many as you want. When you create a project type, you also create the statuses that go along with it. So these are like stages. So in my for sale deals, they start out as a suspect. I find them in a list. I think, oh, this guy's a good 
this guy would be a good buyer for my property, so I make him a suspect. Then when we call him, he either becomes a prospect or he, or he dies. And once he's a prospect, then we try to get him to tour. And once he tours, we try to get an offer. So he, he sort of moves through the system. And these things are what I give you when you buy the program, but you have total control over what's in here. You can delete mine. You can rearrange the order of them. You add your own in. There's, there's no limits to how you use this thing. And, I'll, and I'll, if we have time, I'll show you how I do my, um, my mining using projects. Everybody thinks projects is listings. Well, it is listings, but that you, you've just taken a, a function that's as big as the world and made it as big as a house. It's not just listings, that, that is part of it. This could be for anything, anything at all that you have to put people into a group for. So you can think way outside the box on this and, and not just think about uh, listings. So that's how you that's how you create things. And then then when you go in, and let's say that um, <clears throat> I'm talking to a contact. It doesn't matter who it is. And while I'm talking to them, uh, they tell me that they want to. Um, they're interested in some kind of a property. So what you would have done in any other program is is then switched over to another database and made them, a, made them a prospect in a project, right? I don't wanna do that. I'm in the middle of cold calling these people and I don't wanna switch out of it. So there's a secret menu in, in the CRM and you, you won't know it's there. It's not gonna tell you it's there. You gotta find it. And this is how you find it. Go to, a, go to a record like this one here and right click your mouse. When you right click, you may find a secret menu that you didn't know was there. They're all over the place in my program, but I, I have no way to tell you they're there. You have to right click and say, is there a menu here? So wait, I don't have to go to the calendar. I can just right click on Eric and say, add an event. That's right. You won't leave this screen. You won't leave Eric. You just can create an event. He says, can you call me tomorrow? Put in a call him tomorrow. It automatically got attached to him for me. I didn't have to do it myself. Same thing if he says, hey, uh, I'm out. I'm out looking at your um, your building, Three Flags Plaza. Oh, really? Can you send me information? Don't go to Three Flags Plaza. Don't go to projects. Don't go anywhere. Just right click on his name and say, add to project. When you do that, it brings up the, the screen where you can tell me what project you want to add him to. And you can tell me the information. He says, well, I'm, I'm looking for 4,500 square feet, uh, 12 bucks a foot, something like that. And when I say, okay, he automatically becomes a lead in that project for me. My owner gets, that goes on my owner's report that he called me and he's looking for 4,500 square feet. I may follow up and say, I'm gonna schedule a call for you uh, Monday. I'll send, the, I'll send the information out today. And if you're interested, we can go look at it. I want to keep going on my call list, right? I don't want to get distracted, but I don't want to lose this guy. That's how simple it is. And and like I say, they're all over the place. For example, I was just doing a, a webinar with a company and they were asking me, um, we like to use the properties to drive our day. Some people use contacts. We like to use properties. So we'll do what Bo did. We'll query for a certain area that we're very familiar with and we're going out and we're, we're trying to find uh, information about the property. So we wanna talk to the listing agent or the owner or the property manager. And we have we put that information into our database. Where is it? Um, there's there's two ways to use this, this program. There's two views. Basic view is the list view or the tile view. You saw both of those, but there's also a hybrid view for both of those pages. What, what is a hybrid view? Well, you can't see very much information on these properties, but if you open the hybrid view over here on the right, next to columns, there's a little arrow that splits the screen and gives you access to all the information about the record you're on. Whether you're in list view or, or tile view, it doesn't matter which one you're in. So if I click one of these, everything on the right changes. There's all the information about the building. What I'm looking for is the owner and the, and the listing agent and the contact. So do you see the tabs here at the top? There's detail and the contacts. <clears throat> when I go to this property, I see, okay, we've got the agent in there. So I'm gonna call Eric. I click his phone number, dials my phone. 
hey, Eric, I'm trying to get information on Anthem Plaza. And he says, oh, um, here's the information. And would you mind calling me back on Monday? Yeah, sure. Now watch, this is, this is really critical. I don't wanna leave this screen. I don't wanna to go to Eric's record and do all that. It screws up my whole process here. Just look right here where there's a little hamburger. And when you click that, you have access to create events for Eric, notes for Eric, edit his record, all, all of these things, don't go anywhere. Just do that, add them to a project, add them to a group, whatever you wanna do. And then go right back to the next property and make your call on that property and keep, keep, go, keep your focus on this, don't lose it, but don't lose the lead either. Let the system work for you, let it do all the work for you. It's not like other systems where you have to keep jumping back and forth to do anything. If I did have to go somewhere, I did have to change databases, let's say. I still don't wanna lose where I am. So here's a little trick that you probably don't know about because you probably never right clicked on it. I can right click on any of these databases up here, let's say contacts, and I can open it in a new window. So that takes me to the contact database, but notice it didn't take me out of properties. It opened up a completely separate window. So I don't lose my place in what I'm doing. I'm on the same page but I can do whatever I have to do for this contact. And then I can just get out of it and go right back to what I'm doing. Same thing here where you see this little button. I can pull down that button and it gives me the option to search for a contact. So I'm gonna say search, but I'm not gonna click this search because that, that will open up contacts in this window. I wanna go to a different window. Okay, great. So that means you don't wanna get off properties, right? Jonathan Anderson. And notice again, it brought up Jonathan's record, but in a completely different window. And if you have two monitors or you, I'm using a small monitor so I can do a webinar and you can see the screen. But if you have a big monitor, you can put these side by side and you can keep contacts open on one side and properties open on the other side. And as you move through the records, you can see the owner's information. Sort of, It's sort of like um, this hybrid view, except it could be on a different monitor. So a little bit, little bit bigger. In the, in the case of projects, I get people that call or I call and they surprise me. I get something I wasn't expecting. So in this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to contacts because I'm, I'm looking for leads and I'm just trying to call people that are in my database. I haven't called them in a while. How do I know I haven't called them in a while? There's a field in REA called verified. It tells you when the person, when this person was last verified, sort of like when you buy a shirt or a dress or a little tag in there that says Gonzo verified this or Gonzo packages or whatever. I want to know when the record was last verified by somebody on my team. So here's here's the routine. We we all have two monitors. If you don't have two monitors, get two monitors. Do yourself a huge favor. If you don't have two monitors, go get one right now. It'll change your life. It'll change your work habits it'll make you much more productive. So while I'm talking to Amy, she, I said, hey, are you still in Las Vegas and Howard Hughes? And uh, yeah. So do you see this button right here that I'm highlighting, verify? That's part of the rule in our company. Whenever you talk to someone and verify their information, you click that button. That's, that's all you have to do. Just click the button, nothing else. And what that did is it time stamped her record with right now, 10 to two, uh, the 19th, Tim Cray. So everybody in our office knows that on that date, at that time, Tim verified that Amy's stuff is valid. And everybody's supposed to do that. When you're in the list view, you can decide which columns you wanna see. You can add any columns you want to this view. How do I do that? Right here, there's a, every one of these screens on the right-hand side, there's a column button. And I'm gonna edit this list. And when I edit the list, I get all the fields that are available. One of them is date verified. I'm gonna add that to my list. I'm gonna actually gonna move it right to the top. And because it makes a difference to me, who verified it, I usually will add that in too. Because some people I, I trust more than others when they say they verified something. You don't have to do that, but I, I like to know who verified it. Now watch what happens on the, lift, on the left. 
See how it added those two new columns, date verified and verified by? Yeah, so what? why is that important? This is why it's important. I'm trying to find leads. I'm trying to find people that we haven't talked to. How do I know who they are? I, I just click on this header, verified. And the first time I click on, on it, it sorts all the records by the last time they were verified. Now you see why it's so important. None of these people have ever been verified by anybody in my company. I don't know where they came from. I don't know who they are. But eventually, as I go through these pages of records, I'm going to start running into people that were verified. But it will be people that hadn't been verified in a year or two years or depends on your database, six years, eight years. I've gone to people's offices to do training sessions, and they've got 10,000 contacts in there, and they've only verified 100 of them. I guess they just import stuff like crazy and they ne never follow through with it. So that's a good way to find find people. And now as you're calling them, let's say I call James, click this thing, I click his phone number. He says, yeah, I uh, got out of the, oh, that's a Cushman Wakefield guy. Well, let's pretend he's a buyer. Got out of the market, but I got back in again about a year ago and I'm trying to you know, find properties and so on. <clears throat> so I want to make him, um, a lead, but I don't have anything for him right now. Okay, well then how, you know, basically he says, I'm looking for 4,000 square feet in San Diego. Okay, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna do. I've created a project called for sale and one for lease. Those are two different projects. Well, let's do one. Project, I'm gonna click add. I don't wanna go to projects right now. I don't wanna get out of my flow. I just wanna add a project right from here comes up and it says, what's the name of your project for sale? That's all I need to do. Okay, now I have a project called for sale. It's not about any listing. These are just people that are looking to purchase properties are gonna go into that project. Now I wanna go in and I wanna add one more for lease. And again, these are not. this is not a listing. This is just people that call in and say, I'm looking to lease property. That's all. That's all. That's all I'm doing with this. They're not going to be any specific property at all. So now that I have those two projects created, there's nobody in them right now. But this guy says I'm interested in leasing. Okay, great. I don't have anything that fits your needs. I'm going to right click on you. I'm going to say add to project. Which project do I add them to? For lease. Down here, he's looking for 4,500 square feet. And I ask him, what's your name and phone number? Um, if I don't have it, I do because he happens to be in my database. But let's say that he's just called it on the, uh, out of the blue. That's OK. When you create a lead, over here on the right, there's a little magnifying glass. Do you see the lead link to? When I click that, I have the option to select an existing lead or just create one right now. Okay, so let's say that some some guy calls me up and says, "Hey, I I want to uh, I want to be in your book for something or other." Just right click and say, "Add to project," so the screen comes up. I'm gonna take this guy out and I'm gonna say, "Add a new contact." Okay, you want me to send you information on Three Flags Plaza? Yeah. Okay, what's your name? Joe Schmo. How do you spell Schmo? Uh, what's your phone number? Six, 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 eight, 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 eight. What's your email? Joe. That's all I have to do. He's now a lead in my system, and I can have my person send him out information and call him. That's how, and I did not get off track. Just on a call like that, I added a contact to my database with their phone number and their whatever I have. He gives me his company and email. I, I can go as far as I want, but in my, most cases, they're just looking for some information and they give me their name and phone number and an email. But what's important is I just added them as a generic lead in case I ever get a few minutes and I want to go to my for sale leads or my for lease leads and say, okay, give me everybody looking for 2,000 to 4,000 square feet. I just got a listing on a property. Um, and it comes back with 30 people I've talked to in the last month. I don't even remember who they are. Half the time, I don't even know who they are. They're just a name and a phone number and an email. And I blast them all the information about this space 
just got this listing. I haven't had time to even put it into a package yet. Nobody knows about it. I'm going to put it on the market tomorrow. If you're interested, call me as soon as you can. And you wouldn't believe how fast people call you back when they think that they just got some information before anybody else knows about it. And it turns out to be a good deal. And they're the first ones and they jump on it. That's what people are looking for, right? They're looking for things that nobody knows about yet. They're looking for that stock that's going to tomorrow go up 100,000%. You're going to make a bunch of money on it. They're, they're looking for the deal that they can get before anybody else has a chance. So it's a great way to track leads without losing your place, without wasting any time, and, not, and mainly just not getting off my focus of I'm trying to update my database to get these people verified so that we know who they are. And some of them will, will be dead. Some of them will be a restaurant waiter. Who knows? I'll take them out of my database. But the point is, I'm trying to get through these people one by one. And, and that's what I do, did with my runners, or probably can't call them runners anymore, whatever you call people that are starting out. When they come in, I say, hey, here's a database, 50,000 people in it, sort them by date verified. You find a live one, you can claim them. And as long as nobody else has, has claimed them, they're all yours. They're just sitting there and nobody's calling them. So I give, when you come to work for my company, I give you a whole basket full of leads. You just have to go go talk to them and go and go um, find out what they're interested in. A uh, great way to get started. I don't do real estate anymore, so I'm acting like I'm still doing real estate. But that that is how I wrote REA back in 1980. That is how I conducted my business. And we were a small shop, ten of us, and you'd be you'd be shocked. When the big buyers would come in town, they'd go to the big companies. In those days, it was Coldwell Banker. Uh, who's now C.B. Richard Ellis and Grubb and Ellis and so on. And they'd come to our office and they'd just walk in and go, where is everybody? <laughs> well, we get more stuff from you guys than we do from all the other houses put together. Where's, where's the team? Well, in 19, that was probably 1984. Nobody even had a computer. I think we were the only office that everybody had a computer. Nobody knew how to use them. So because we used the system correctly and everybody was efficient, we were able to get information out to people very fast and follow up on it. We didn't lose anything. So one more thing I'll show you and then I'll stop because it's it's been an hour and a half of you probably. Yeah, Tim, there's a few things I wanted to, to go over. Make sure you make sure you covered before you wrap up. So if you got something else, do it. And I'm just gonna show yeah. one other thing that that I think is really important to know. Let's say that um I'm talking to Jean Claude and uh he says, hey, I, I'm interested in your building here. I'm going to uh, go right click on him and add to project. And I say, what what property are you looking for? And he says, I'm looking for uh, or I'm looking at King's Jewelry. And I say, I have three other listings just like it. Would you be interested in those? Sure. I don't I don't want to create four or five different lead records. Right. I want to create one and go on to my merry way again. So when you're creating a lead like this. You can add as many projects as you want to this record. Balboa Office Park. Uh, I don't even know what leads I have. Let's add the, add the uh, yeah, I have no idea what, this is a fake database, so. Okay, here we go. Fires Emporium, uh, Genesee Apartments. So what'll happen now is when I hit the button, let's let's put a note in here. What happened there is it created different lead records for this guy. And if I go look at my projects tab to see what he's a lead for these, when I hit, when I see projects, it's a little confusing to people. Those are not actually projects. Those are the projects that this guy's a lead for. And that's, and that's, what's important to know. So when I go there, it will create, forget which guy I was on when I Jean, did that. John Claude. John Claude. Oh yeah. My old friend, John Claude Goldstein. See what it did there. It created uh, four individual lead records with the same notes on it. Why? Well, because he's interested in four different things, and each one of these properties is a different li is a different listing. When I send out my marketing report, I don't want the guy that owns King's Jewelry to see that I sent it to Balboa Office Park. So that's why it's a separate record. 
this this guy will see him in there as a lead, see that I sent him the information, but he'll have no idea I sent him three or four of them. And for me to follow up with this guy, every time he calls me, hey, Tim, it's John Claude. Hey, how you doing? Um, I'm great. Uh, you know what? I'm not really interested in this one. So I can just change the status right here. Take him out, dump him on the thing. This guy, I want to tour it. So right here, I change it to tour, schedule, schedule the tour on Monday, and so on. All of this automatically updated in my report for my owner. I don't have to go anywhere else. Just right on this screen, change the status. Don't have to even open the record to do it. Just click on it, set the status to whatever it is, and then go on with my life. And, th and this guy's taken care of. He'll be in my calendar. Everybody in my team will see that he called and he's now moved up in the status. So if you remember that, the ability to add somebody to multiple projects, and I may have also done when I was, if I was smart, which I'm not, I wouldn't have just added him to those projects. I would have also added him to my project called for sale because I want him in there as a lead in case something else comes up, right? So all I had to do was just add that project in there with the other projects that I had. Okay, Jeff, I'll stop. I'm sure everybody's going, this guy will never shut up. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Bo, I didn't want to step on your stuff. I just- No, you got lot, lots of camera. You could go on for a long time and I appreciate that. But there were, there were a few things that came up. Um, one was, they wanted to see again, how Bo found owners from properties. And if you could show how you have, linked owners to properties and how easy that is to as you say you're not calling the property you're calling the the owner of the property that you want to contact okay when you're on a property record you have a tab here on the right called contacts in there you have the site contact that would be the property manager the owner and the agent i want to make somebody the owner of this property do you see there's a magnifying glass here when you click that it says, do you want to select a contact or select a company as the owner, or do you want to create one? That's all you do. I'll say select the contact. I'll find the guy. He's now the owner of the property. Okay, he sells it. I can go in and I can say, I want to select a different owner or a different company, whatever it is, or I want to create a new one. All the options are right here on the menu. That, that's all you have to do to make somebody an owner of a property or the agent or uh, the property manager. And then the one of the beauties that, that you've built him is if one owner has five of the properties on the left, by using that linked button on the top of your property list, you get a consolidated view of all the owners that you have to call. So it might not be 185, you have 185 properties, but there may be only 125 owners of, of all those properties. What, what happened to me, guys, is I I was, I was got really excited about doing these mailings. It wasn't called junk mail back then because nobody knew you could do it. Write one letter and send it to a thousand people and it all had their name on it. They all thought I wrote a letter to them. Now everybody thinks it's junk. But what was happening was one guy owned three or four buildings. So he'd get three or four of the same letter with his name on it, which made it pretty obvious that this guy's – what, what is this guy doing sending me all these letters? So what I decided was I won't, I won't put the owner on the property, which is how the other programs do it. When you open up a property record, they'll have a, they'll have a field in there for the owner. So every property, if one guy owns five properties, you'll put his name in that field five times. Well, I said, that's not going to work. I want to link that guy to as many properties as he owns. So when I go in here and I say, look up the linked owners, if one guy owns five properties, he still only comes up once because it's giving me the people that own the properties that are in my filter. And that guy's only in my contact database once. So when I do a mailing now, I know I'm not mailing anybody more than one thing, one email on an email campaign, one letter, whatever it is. And that's the beauty of linking the things along with the fact that if I were to go to, I don't think this guy owns anything else, but if I went to his record and Bo showed this and clicked the links tab, I'll see every property that he owns. And I can talk to him about any of them. Grove Business Park, Bertros, Grove Business Park, whatever, 
um, some of these are him being a tenant. It might be a sale comp that is in here or a lease comp. So I may say to him, interesting, Barton, you sold Three Flags Plaza 10 years ago. I have the listing on that right now. How cool is that? You sold it for $10 million and you sold it to the guy that I'm selling it for. Not that that's ever going to happen to you, but sometimes it does. It's good to have that information, though, because when you're talking to them and you know all the properties they own and you can talk to them about it, they're pretty impressed. Like, wow, I must be a pretty big deal if he knows all this stuff. Anyway, that's how you add an owner. All right. A bunch more questions. Uh, um yeah, th yes, we, we do track email correspondence. You should you need to have your system linked to your Outlook and there's been other sessions that we've we've shown that. So you can you can uh, make sure you're under your account you're set up to link. Um, let's see. The, the, the a question uh, you, you talked about using the for sale and for lease under a project. Could you not just as well and uh, do you have a reason for doing that versus using a group yeah because I, I want to note what they're looking for not just that they're looking for a for sale perfect they're very specific i don't i want medical office i want it to be in chula vista and i need five whatever five million dollars something like that so i want to actually create a lead record where i can put in specifics about what they're looking for and it and it might not apply to one area. It might be four or five areas. Same thing I do with vendors. And I get this question all the time. Um, how do I track title agents and escrow officers and plumbers and nurses and clowns? Th those people are, are not really real estate people in the fact that they're not a tenant or a buyer or seller. They're ancillary. They're, they're, they're part of it title companies, escrow officers, all that stuff. But what I call those people are vendors. Now, a contact can be any, anything you want them to be. One contact, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna duplicate your contacts or your companies. You only want one of each. And that's why I give you the tab called vendors and one called tenants and one called agents and one called investor. When you go to these tabs, this is the same, however you say that name, this is the same person but they could be a buyer, and an investor is a buyer or seller, and I'll fill all this stuff in. They could also be a tenant, they could be an agent, and they could be a vendor. What, what is a vendor, Tim? A vendor is all those people you have to work with, but they're not gonna probably buy anything or lease anything from you. So when I create a vendor, I go to the business button here. You see where it says business? And I, and I wanna put in the different businesses they're in. I don't want to have nine different fields for it. I don't want to use groups for that. I want to put it right here in this field. So what I've done is on all these kinds of fields, you'll see a little button next to the field. See this little button here? When you click that, it brings up a lookup box. You can add as many things as you want to this dialogue. You can see I've got some in here right now. You can add any you want. You can also delete them. You, you might even have some in there because I think I, I add some for you when you buy the program, but you can get rid of mine and put your own in is all i have to do to make him an appraiser is just pick appraiser hit the button and he becomes an appraiser now if i want to find appraisers i query vendors for business contains appraiser hey well tim what if he's like four or five things okay you, you need to do a little bit of work yourself on the field Here, here's what i'm talking about this, this pop-up is always there, but you see, I can only change one. I can only pick one thing. That's because I've, I've designed the pop-up to only let you pick one thing. If I right click on a label and I'm on business, I get a menu that says field definitions. Okay, what can I do in there? Well, the first thing you can do is you can change the caption from business to something else. I don't want to do that. You can change the color. Why would I do that? because that makes the field stand out. So if it's a really important field in your company, you could change the color of that. And when people are on that screen, they immediately see, uh oh, I forgot to fill in that field. But here's what I'm doing in the pop-up tables, comma separated values. What is a comma separated value? Let me show you what happens. You notice when I pulled up the, the lookup before, I could only choose one thing on the list. By making it a comma separated value, pulling up the same box, 
Now when I bring up that same pop-up, you notice instead of one, I now have a little selection box where I can make this person a whole bunch of different hats, as many as I want. So the, all of those will go into the business field. And I did it again by just right clicking, picking field definition and turning on comma separated values. Now I did, I made a mistake a second ago and I'll show you, I'll show you why, why I added that. I have this field called business in a couple of tabs because I, I like to use it a lot. I don't want to have to define this thing in every single table that I've got. Look at all these entries. I just want to have, I want to do this once. Okay, so when I went to the vendor tab and I right clicked on business and said field definitions, I accidentally unchecked this box that says use same table. I'm going to check that again. And in here I have business. So it's now using the same table as the personal one. So I don't have to redefine the table over and over again. I can tell every field, you can use the same one I already defined in the other thing. And when I do that, then all the pop-ups show up here too. And if I make a change to this list, it's changing the business list for all the different tables. Uh, just another quick way to get this thing working for yourself so you don't have to do this over and over and over again. And anywhere that there's a lookup table like this, you can associate it with one that already exists so you don't have to re-enter everything again. Tim, quick, quick uh, final question. I think, yeah, so I know we're, we're, we've gone long. The setting up and the theory behind the organizational hierarchy that you've built into the system, what's an organization, subsidiary, company, and how do they relate, and how can you see them best? Um, okay, so what is... Uh... What is an organization and a subsidiary? N nobody has this. No program has it, Tim. Why do, you, why do you have to make everything so complicated? Here's why. I worked with a lot of, of really big companies. Let me go to a different database. Big in the sense that they had multiple arms like Campbell's. Okay. Um, Campbell's has a whole bunch of things you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know. Vlasic Pickles, Campbell's Soup, Pepperidge Farm, uh, on and on and on. Those are those are what are called subsidiaries um, but they're all under Campbell's that's the organization subway subway is the organization but there's a whole bunch of different stores under subway so if you're dealing with really really large companies like that it's helpful to be able to organize them by the organization which is the parent company if you want to think of it that way um, by the subsidiary in this case where my example Vlasic pickles and when you go to any one of those so you can see here i've got an organization called wellspan health services and there's 81 of those but they're all owned by this one organization the subsidiary is york hospital apple surgical hill and so on and in some cases they have multiple multiple um offices that are under the same subsidiary so if i look down here i see that i have uh let's put them in order by subsidiary that'll help all of these surgical centers are this are a subsidiary where they do surgery for this company okay okay that sort of makes sense kind of not really but i'm following you okay let's do it a little simpler nai nai is an organization there are a whole bunch of different NAI offices, and some of those, and those we'll call those subsidiaries, some of those have multiple offices. So, I, I don't, Jeff, oh, Capital, NAI Capital. NAI Capital, perfect example. NAI Capital is a subsidiary of NAI, but they have 300 offices. So every time I enter an NAI Capital, I make the organization NAI, the subsidiary NAI Capital, and then the office is really the address of that of that brokerage house. And now I want to go in and I want to see all of those people. So I go to the company record like this one, let's say, and I go to the contact tab. And on the contact tab, I see the contact that's at this particular address. But I see that the organization is Wellspan, or it could have been NAI, and the subsidiary is Apple Hill, and it could have been uh, NAI Capital. I want to see the contacts, not just at this one office, but I want to see the contacts at this subsidiary, meaning I want to see all the contacts that work for NAI Capital. I don't care where they are. How do I do that? 
Next to contact, there's this little drop down where you can say, I want to see the subsidiary. That means not this one guy. I want to see every contact that's at Apple Hill Surgical Center because that's the subsidiary. So when I click the subsidiary, it will change that window to show me the contacts at that, at that um, subsidiary. Then I can sort them by title and find out who's the CEO or who's the president or who's the whatever it is. Or I could say organization. Okay, that's going to find every contact that works for these 81 WellSpan Health Services, no matter what's no matter what subsidiary they're in. It will tell me their title and their phone number and their email and all all that kind of stuff. And then I can also use that window, and I can go. I don't, oh, here's a guy. I can go to the contacts, which will take me to the contact table, but filter it so I only see the contacts that are at these 81 companies everybody's going to sleep jeff you better close it well, out that's perfect we are good ready to wrap um there will be a recording this is a lot to cover so in case for, you know, some of you had needed to leave but you're not on the call now those that needed to leave early they'll get the tail end and be able to uh, catch up and uh, we might uh, parse this into a few different segments for future uh, digestion to make it easier please keep coming with your questions and Thoughts, use the user group. Don't forget to register on Facebook. You can post ideas, thoughts, questions there, and we'll do our best to interact and provide feedback in between sessions and uh, welcome you back next month. So again, next week, Tim will be able to show more about the, the latest in the, the development sequence, and that's Cray Cray next month. We'll be back with the, another session of the user group, so please register, look for that in the mail. Uh, if I didn't answer your question today, please uh, send me a note or post it back into the user group. and We'll try to catch up. Uh, there was just so many and so much to cover. We didn't get to them all, but uh, that's it. Uh, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Bo. Great stuff. We really appreciate your time, Bo, particularly hey, for uh, sharing with us today and everyone for joining and, and participating. And uh, again, be safe, be well, and we... Uh, Hope you uh, weather this difficult cycle that we're going through the best you can and uh, stay strong, use real next to its maximum and uh, be as productive as you can. Appreciate all of your support and have a great day.